Francis Maud, Lord Maud, is someone who has been massively supportive and significant to Open UK. Um, he has rocked up at lunches through the pandemic, chatting to people on the digital lunch environment. He's contributed into the Q&A. He's even written a section for us for phase two of our report. He's been a great friend to us, which is very appreciated by me and I know everyone at Open UK. But perhaps more significantly, he was a cabinet office minister who brought us GDS and who brought the UK a world leading perspective and open. So it's a great honor for me to welcome Francis to the stage today to give our keynote. Well, Amanda, thank you very much indeed for that. And it's a, it's a huge pleasure and honor for me to be with you today and, and to deliver this uh, keynote speech. It's a great event. It's a great buzz around this. Uh, for me, it's exciting to be part of this event, but also in the vicinity of, of COP, part of the COP. And I wanted to start with a few reflections on, on the story so far with this, this COP. Um, there was, it started with a great deal of cynicism around it. Is it all orchestrated in advance? Well, plainly not. Um, <laughs> is, it, uh, uh, is anything going to happen? Uh, and uh, I actually think it's, I've been a bit surprised by how much has come out of this and how encouraged I feel uh, by what's happened. And you just look at the commitments on methane reduction, on deforest, uh, reversing deforestation, on China, uh, reasserting its commitment to net zero by 2060, India by 2070, and yes, we know that's not 2050, but at least there's engagement and credible commitment, uh, and a commitment yesterday to the China-US collaboration. Why is it credible? Well, it's necessity, uh, and that's one of the things that I think has marked this moment, is this sense, yes, time uh, is running out, but China and India are both countries where have a huge uh, amount of the population proportion of, in both cases, huge populations and huge chunks of their GDP, which are vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So this is not China and India, you need to take part for the benefit of the world. This is actually now the moment where self-interest comes into uh, harmony with the need to do things that save the planet more generally. And that's why this seems to me to be a big moment. But there's another thing as well, which is directly relevant to us here in this tent today. One US veteran of many COP gatherings has been heard to say that this was the best COP so far, by far. And why, he said, is partly the sense that time is running out, as I said, but the main reason that this is the time when the private sector showed up and showed that it was taking it seriously and that in every sense, this time, it meant business. Which brings me to the subject of today's event and its relevance to the fight against climate change. Technology is about innovation. Uh, it's created by innovation. It thrives on innovation. Open technology, open source software, open hardware, open data, open standards has been the heartbeat of innovation in the digital world. Open technology is when companies or organizations, you all know this, make their software or hardware available for others to use, allowing them to recycle and instantly be part of the circular economy. This can be done uh, without cost, and then those organizations can support and enhance and develop that technology over time alongside the community, which of its nature promotes more sustainable and equitable technology. For technology to be sustainable, it has today to be open. This community collaborative approach is essential. A more open approach builds the community faster. It encourages sharing, collaboration, and it delivers higher quality compared to everyone trying to do their own thing. Since it was officially first defined in 1998 alongside the creation of the Open Source Initiative, the definition for software has made it easier to share and to do so within a structure. Today, open source has led to the creation of some of the world's 
most valuable technology companies. Databricks, a company put together by the creators of Apache Spark, is now valued at $38 billion. MongoDB, I remember visiting MongoDB very nearly 10 years ago when it was a handful of people uh, and doing amazing things, now valued at 33 billion. Confluent, uh, valued at more than 18 billion. Uh, and you know, the sale, recent sale of Open UK sponsor Red Hat, a huge uh, tech transaction. These, these are indications that Open is now valued. It was thought to be something that diminished value, but now it's understood much more increasingly. This is the power of markets. It's understood that it creates value. It doesn't destroy it. The cloud, like the internet, is built on open source, and often it's the submarine powering the digital economy. So a word about GDS, the GDS story. When, in 2010, I re-entered government after an 18-year sabbatical, liberated as I was by the electors um, in 1992, um, we recognized the value of open. Sharing approaches, code methods would help everyone, we believed, across the public sector to design and build what the public required. We committed to a digital by default approach to government services, powered wherever possible by open source, open standards, and open data. In the six months after the creation of GDS in 2010-2011, uh, we uh, launched gov.uk. Over the next period, we closed down nearly 2,000 government websites. We kept finding more and more. Every time we closed one down, another one uh, would pop out. We had to close that. It was likened by someone to those fairground games, whack a rat. You, as soon as you, you close one down, another one appears, and you have to close that one down as well. So our, uh, uh, and the whole thing, uh, we onboarded uh, the whole of government onto a single website, built rigorously around the needs of the user, built around citizen, user need. I always remember in the uh, GDS uh, building, uh, in overlooking one of the underground stations in London, somebody had papered over the w a window, with cut a small hole in it, so when you were standing there, all you could see is people going in and out of the tube station. And then they wrote users with an arrow, just to remind people that's what it's about. We'd create government services for citizens, for users, not around the convenience of the government, which is how far too often uh, has been done. And I see that, and I now work with governments in other parts of the world to take what we painfully learned in driving this process to help them to serve their citizens uh, ever better. And to our surprise, in um, 2013, gov.uk won the Design Council's Design of the Year uh, award. Not the website Design of the Year, but the overall Design of the Year. It beat into second and third place the Shard and the Thomas Heatherwick uh, Olympic Cauldron. Um, and, uh, and it's not a thing of immense aesthetic beauty, it's just works and it is design and it is that thing is designed around the needs uh, of the user and it was built largely in-house uh, with open source code and that code has since been used by numerous other governments each one of course developing and enhancing the code for the benefit of themselves but also for all other users uh, it's had a real impact on other governments uh, in on their approach to technology um, it, is, it was reported that President Obama, uh, after the Obamacare website, which had been sourced in the normal, conventional, now hope, hopefully outdated way, and wasn't a success, he said, what is it the Brits are doing? Whatever they're doing, I want one of them. Uh, and uh, so set up US Digital Service. Uh, Australia the same, I still have in my, deep in my inbox, a, email from Malcolm Turnbull shortly before he became Prime Minister saying, Francis, if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, you should be feeling very flattered. Uh, he was setting up the digital transformation uh, agency there, based, modeled on what we had done. And of course, we had um, inherited government IT that was the most expensive in the world. I don't want to boast, but, uh, 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 but also notorious for car crash failures. We were ensnared 
in a spider's web of huge, multi-year, impenetrable IT contracts with dependence, built-in dependence on proprietary products and exclusive services provided by a pretty narrow group of multinational vendors. There was little to no interoperability between different parts of government. There was massive duplication. Uh, there were wheels being expensively reinvented every day of the week. It was costing the taxpayer sums beyond counting, and it was failing the citizens who were dependent on the services, and it was failing the officials who were struggling to work efficiently. So we broke open this closed system. We reformed how we procured digital and IT. We unleashed a vibrant ecosystem of startups, entrepreneurs, and SMEs rapidly moving up the value chain. One of the worst mischiefs we discovered was it lay in the opaque world of the government's data center estate. First problem, no one knew where they were, how many there were, their location, and who, if anyone, uh, controlled them. The second was, because there was no coordination and hideously limited interoperability, there was absurd over-provision. Every department and agency, and often every part of every department and agency, had provided its own business continuity capacity. And unsurprisingly, in some parts of government, it emerged that there was as much as 97% redundancy with all of the horrible costs of energy and, uh, 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 and finance that that involved. Late on in the coalition government, too late, wish we'd done it earlier, like a lot of these things, uh, we set up, we created the Crown, Crown Hosting, a joint venture between the private sector and the cabinet office to provide effectively a receptacle where different parts of government could lift and shift their legacy hosting into one place much more energy efficient, much more financially efficient, uh, and it would led to the eradication uh, of vast sways of redundancy, and as a result, the government's carbon footprint took a big turn for the better. So this same approach, collaboration and community, sharing and recycling, reusing technology is needed today around climate change, and the UK can offer leadership in collaboration, as we'll hear today, you'll hear from a wide range of people uh, talking about this uh, later on in the course of the day. We have to make it easier and faster to implement more energy efficient processes, to support new industries, evolved existing ones, and to help countries around the world make these changes happen. It's one thing to know what to do. It's quite another thing to be able to do it. Uh, in my business, where we work with other governments, where we say we're pra we're not we look like consultants, but actually we're practitioners. We're all people who've been in government. We know working out what to do is kind of 10 percent. 90 percent is implementation. Working out how the hell do you make it happen and how make it happen sustainably. So it's not a one-off. It doesn't regress. You build it in. You you embed it, entrench it, and build it in. And 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 understand that it never ends. And people often used to say to me when I was in government driving reforms, they'd say, Francis, when's this going to come to an end? Answer, never. Because if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. There is no such thing these days as steady state. There is no business as usual. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. So this is uh, absolutely essential, and we can help. UK is good at this. Um, open source is now behind the majority of new ways of working with data uh, that exist today. Improved access to data, frictionless sharing, uh, is at the heart of the UK's journey to a healthy, growing, net zero economy. Uh, you'll hear today later uh, from Gavin Starks on I Icebreaker One, the UK energy sector digital task force led by my friend and former colleague Laura Sands. These are at the forefront of developing our new national data infrastructure. And that's infrastructure that's as important as our roads, rail, water, and broadband networks. It'll be developed for the energy sector. And like GDS was, it'll be replicated, uh, we expect, both across uh, other UK utilities, but also across the world. And it's going to be essential for delivering the UK's innovation and climate agenda. We'll need access 
access to data to bring more renewables on stream, to scale up our EV charging network, to cut emissions from our buildings, almost everything we need to be able to transition to a net zero economy will depend on access to data. And the same principles that apply to around open source will have to be applied to data. We need it to be accessible, to be easily shared, and for it to be possible to collaborate around that data. Uh, while I was driving the digital program in government, I we also drove an aggressive open data program and found that we tapped into a very rich vein of creativity uh, within government, people producing reasons why it couldn't be done. Um, and they, first of all, national security was a good one, commercial confidentiality, privacy was always a one to, to scare uh, politicians, uh, um, and legal reasons, which often evaporated as soon as you actually looked at what the law said. Uh, and finally, the last, the last resort, when all of that had failed, they would say, but Minister, the quality of the data isn't very good. We need time to clean it up and prepare it. To which my answer was, publish it, and you'll find it gets better quite quickly. Uh, partly because of the embarrassment factor, but also because of the crowd, crowdsourcing factor. It's crucial that we drive this, and we have to think about how the UK is part of this global community. So there is a big story here. The UK can create and support the companies that will directly and indirectly lead the industry around preventing climate change. The open approach will help them to scale faster than would be possible on their own. But they have to be part of a global community that collaborates on these issues in order to make the difference. That approach collaboration and community, sharing and recycling and reusing technology, that's what's needed around climate change. And open energy is a success story that proves how much that's needed. It's new non-profit service that makes it easy to search, access, and securely share energy data. It will unlock access to data held by thousands of organizations and institutions to enable an open marketplace which will pave the way to our net zero future. This is a big moment, an exciting moment, where the confluence of technology and innovation, the way in which the cost of renewables has plummeted to now undercut the cost of carbon energy, uh, the excitement around the, the mobilizing of, of trillions of, of dollars of private finance around that innovation, around that investment, the uh, refocusing of investment criteria around environmental and social uh, objectives as much as around the pure financial objectives, and the understanding that these are not things which pull in different directions in anything beyond the immediate short term. These are supporting each other. This is this moment. And when we look back at it, if we get this right, and what you all in this room are part of will be central to this, we'll look back and say, this was our time. Thank you. It's not often that I'm at a loss for words, as you all know, and I don't quite know what to say about that. I don't think you could have hit the nail on the head more than you just did in those last 15 minutes. But if you think you've got off my stage that easily, you have another thing coming. So I'd like to invite you back, Francis, to meet my friend, the artist Frank Toe. Frank, do you want to explain what you're doing? Francis, would you like to come back? Hello, my name is Frank Toll. I am an artist, contemporary artist, and also an art lecturer from the University of Highlands in the Islands. I have been, for the past couple of years, I have been working with, a, uh, with Iron Swedish Development Partner on a new alloy coy called Humanium Metal. Humanium Metal is the first sustainable fair trade metal made from illegal firearms. It is Iron Swedish Development Partner is an organization based in Sweden, working in collaboration with the United Nations to 
seize and destroy illegal firearms and melt them down into alloys, which could be used for fair trade. I have been commissioned by Iron Swedish Development Partner as the official artist to create a new colour and a new kind of paint and also create artwork from illegal firearms. Uh, if, after the, uh, the kind of speech, you're more than welcome to come over to the stand to check out the work for Humanity Metal. But I'd like to give Lord Francis Monday from Iron Swedish Development Partner this Humanium pen. This is actually a pen made from illegal firearms, basically made from AK-47s. And it kind of gives that notion that the pen is mightier than the sword. The aims for the human metal is to make a world without Ill illegal gun violence and also to make out the world a better place and encourage world peace in coordination to the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So, Lord Franz Monday, this is the Humanian pen, which I and Swedish partner would like to give to you. If I can open it, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. So, it's only a limited edition of 500 of these were made. Thank you. What an amazing thing. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. Thank you very much. It's also, we, also for sustainability issues. Uh, well, it's down as well. Very good. <laughs> Great. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.